Hey, so what's Top Golf? Well, it's golf, but it's also not golf. Not golf? Yeah, not golf, but still golf. And not golf. Yes. With the golf. Exactly. So you're saying it's golf. And not golf. Just to be clear, Top Golf is 100% golf. And also 100% not golf. But that's 200%. Right, but it's like a million percent fun, so can we stop doing math and just go play? It's golf. It's not golf. It's Top Golf. Download the app, book a bay, and come play around. You hear that? That's the awkward silence of a family dinner after you just got caught vaping. Most vapes contain high levels of nicotine and disappointment. Brought to you by The Real Cost and the FDA. This is Space Time Series 25, Episode 16, for broadcast on the 7th of February, 2022. Coming up on Space Time, a new study claims that water was flowing across the Martian surface for much longer than previously thought. There's more evidence of recent volcanism on the planet Venus. And there's also more evidence of the growing war in space with a Chinese spacecraft observed grabbing hold of another satellite and moving it into a different orbit. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study claims that water was flowing across the surface of the red planet Mars for much longer than previously thought. The new data from NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft suggests that surface water left salt minerals behind as recently as 2 billion years ago. Mars was once a warm, wet world, with rivers, streams, lakes and even a major northern hemisphere ocean. But that was billions of years ago. But as the planet's atmosphere thinned over time, the water evaporated, and Mars today is a freeze-dry desert. Now, it's commonly believed that the Martian water evaporated around 3 billion years ago, but scientists looking through 15 years of Mars reconnaissance orbiter data have now found evidence which reduces that timeline significantly. The new research reveals signs of liquid water on the red planet as recently as 2 to 2.5 billion years ago meaning water was flowing on Mars a billion years longer than previous estimates. The findings reported in the journal AGU Advances examines chloride salt deposits left behind as icy meltwater flowing across the landscape evaporated. While the shape of some valley networks already hinted that water must have flowed on Mars fairly recently, the salt deposits provide the first real mineral evidence confirming the presence of this liquid water. The discovery also raises new questions about how long microbial life would have survived on Mars if it had formed there at all. On Earth, the matter is very simple. Wherever we find water, we find life. And so that obviously raises questions about what happens when we find liquid water beyond the Earth. For their study, the authors used the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter's Compact Reconnaissance Imaging Spectrometer for Mars Instrument, better known as CRISM. CRISM was able to map chloride salts across the clay-rich highlands of the Martian Southern Hemisphere. This is the terrain pot-marked with impact craters, and these craters are key to dating the salts. See, the fewer craters a terrain has, the younger that terrain is. So by counting the number of craters in a given area of the surface, scientists can estimate its age. They found that many of the salts were in depressions once home to shallow ponds on gently sloping volcanic plains. The scientists also found winding dry channels nearby, former streams that once fed surface runner from the occasional melting of ice or permafrost into these ponds. So the crater counting and the evidence of salts on top of volcanic terrain allowed scientists to date the deposits. Salt mineral deposits were first discovered on the Red Planet 14 years ago by the Mars Odyssey spacecraft which was launched back in 2001. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has much higher resolution instruments than Odyssey did. 
It was launched in 2005 and has been studying the salts among many other features on Mars ever since. This is space time. Still to come. New evidence of recent volcanism on Venus. And more evidence of the growing war in space, with a Chinese spacecraft observed grabbing hold of another satellite and moving it into a different orbit. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A new data analysis has found more evidence of recent volcanism on the planet Venus. The data reported in the journal Geophysical Research Planets was contained in 31-year-old observations by NASA's Magellan spacecraft. It suggests volcanic activity erupted on the Venusian surface within the last few tens of millions of years. Now that's incredibly recently in geologic timescales. It adds to a growing body of evidence that volcanoes on Venus didn't go extinct as long ago as many people had previously thought. As well as being Earth's nearest planetary neighbour, Venus is often considered Earth's sister planet. That's because they're both almost the same size with similar masses and diameters. They were both formed under similar conditions, out of the same sorts of materials and in the same part of the solar system. In fact, Venus once excited speculation that it could provide a host for the first human colony in space. See, scientists thought that Venus's dense cloud cover meant lots of rain, sort of like a tropical rainforest here on Earth. After all, Venus is closer to the sun than the Earth, so temperatures there are hotter, and that would mean more water evaporation, and that would mean more rain clouds. So, scientists envisage that under its thick cloud cover, Earth's sister planet was covered in a lush, green tropical rainforest, sort of like the Amazon jungle on steroids. Some, with the right degree of imagination, even speculated that tropical rainforests must have meant lots of animal life. And because rainforests seem really primitive, that must have meant dinosaurs. But we now know that if Venus is Earth's sister planet, then it's somewhat of a twisted sister. In fact, Soviet and American probes have revealed Venus to be the closest thing to hell in our solar system. For some reason, it's developed a massive runaway greenhouse effect. Its surface is scorchingly hot, with average temperatures of 462 degrees Celsius. That's hot enough to melt lead. And as for those thick, opaque planet-shrouding clouds, well, they do cause rain. But the rain isn't water. Instead, it's droplets of metal-eating sulfuric acid. Scientists have seen what look like snow caps on some of Venus's taller mountain ranges. But it turns out that snow isn't frozen water. It's actually metallic. And as for those sulfuric acid clouds, they're so heavy they crash down on Venus's rich carbon dioxide-based atmosphere, acting like the lid on a pressure cooker and giving the entire planet a surface pressure some 92 times greater than average sea level surface pressure on Earth. Venus rotates on its axis in retrograde compared to most other planets in the solar system. In other words, the sun rises in the west and sets in the east. But it's a really slow rotation, taking 243 Earth days to complete one revolution. And as Venus orbits the sun in 224.7 Earth days, it means a Venusian day actually lasts longer than its year. The surface of Venus is dominated by more than 1,600 volcanic structures. That's more than any other planet in the solar system. The surface is actually 90% basalt and consists of a mosaic of volcanic lava plains, showing evidence of regular periodic resurfacing by floods of lava. It all indicates that volcanism has played a major role in shaping Venus's surface. Venus has shield volcanoes, widespread lava flows, unusual volcanoes called pancake domes, and arachnid or tick-like structures called scallop margin domes, a geological feature that's never been found on Earth. Interestingly, there's no evidence of any plate tectonic activity on Venus. In the 31 years since NASA's Magellan spacecraft entered orbit around Venus, researchers have been using the mission's radar images, topography and gravity mapping to understand the surface history of this cloud-covered world. With significantly fewer impact craters than on planets like, say, Mercury or Mars or even the Earth's moon. 
and the craters that do exist are randomly scattered across the planet. Because crater numbers build up over time, Venus's low number of craters means the planet's been resurfaced over the last roughly 300 million to billion years. Now, of course, resurfacing happens on Earth as well, but that's because of ongoing water and wind erosion and plate tectonics and volcanism. But how the resurfacing happened on Venus still remains a mystery. It's unclear if this all happened in a single catastrophic event that resurfaced the entire planet at once, randomly distributed ongoing events that systematically resurfaced Venus over time, or some combination of both. To understand what's happening on Venus, it's necessary to understand when Venus's volcanoes have been active. So, the question of whether Venus has had geologically recent ongoing volcanism has been an enduring enigma for the Magellan mission. The truth is, scientists still don't have a smoking gun, but there is more and more evidence suggesting a recently and potentially currently active planet. And as computers have improved, it's become possible to do more and more with Magellan's finite data set. So, scientists used a high-resolution stereotopography data set to look at a volcano at the edge of the 350-kilometer-wide aromatic corona. Now, coronas are another one of these strange Venusian features. They're roughly circular and are surrounded by a ring of cracks that appear, well, sort of like a crown and are thought to actually be large surface faults. Some corona, like Aramati, feature nearby volcanoes and lava flows. The study's lead author, Megan Russell from the Planetary Science Institute, says that instead of looking at the surface of the volcano or the lava flows, her team looked at how the volcano deformed the ground around it. You see, in response to the wet of the volcano, the ground around it bends and flexes like a plastic ruler. And we know that's the case because we see the same kind of deformation in the bending of the seafloor around the Hawaiian Islands. And from this deformation, scientists can infer properties like heat flow local to the volcano. Over time, these kinds of structures can evolve, and so the degree of deformation that's being observed can hint at how old or young a feature might be and how much heat might be flowing under the surface. Russell says the modelling suggests that the shape and topography of this particular corona indicates that it's geologically young and so would have similar geologically young volcanism associated with it. This report from the Planetary Science Institute. In the 31 years since NASA's Magellan spacecraft entered orbit around Venus, researchers have been using the mission's instruments to understand the surface history of this cloud-covered world. Magellan's radars revealed a planet with very few impact craters. Since impact events should happen steadily over the millennia, this implies something wiped Venus's surface clean, either all at once or steadily over time. That something could be volcanoes. One of the questions that's been really interesting for us is whether or not Venus has had geologically recent or ongoing volcanism. And this has been an enduring enigma from the Magellan mission. We still have no smoking gun regarding this, but there are really more and more lines of evidence that suggest a recently and potentially currently active planet. Using a combo of new image processing techniques and only Magellan's best data, PSI's Megan Russell and Katherine Johnson used geophysics to understand the eruption history of a volcano at the edge of the 350-kilometer-across Aramati Corona. So instead of looking at the surface of a volcano or volcanic flows, you look at how a particular volcano deforms the ground around it. In response to the weight of the volcano, the ground around it bends, kind of like the flexing of a plastic ruler. This same kind of deformation is seen on Earth. An example of this is the bending of the seafloor around the Hawaiian Islands. From this deformation, we can infer properties like heat flow local to the volcano. Over time, these kinds of structures can evolve, and the degree of deformation that is observed hints at how old or young a feature might be, and how much heat might be flowing under the surface. Previous modeling studies suggest that the shape and the topography of this corona that the volcano in our study sits on indicate that it is geologically young, and therefore we can expect it to have similarly geologically young volcanism associated with it. Magellan's data is limited, with only 20% of Venus having the kind of Magellan data to allow this type of a study. And not all that data was equally good. 
Russell and Johnson were lucky to find the one corona with extremely high quality data. Until we have more data, we can't know how common, or not, these features may be. Luckily, three Venus missions are planned, and we can dream of seeing this research replicated to study all of Venus's potential volcanoes in the not-too-distant future. This is space time. Still to come, more evidence of the growing war in space with a Chinese spacecraft observed grabbing hold of a satellite and moving it into a different orbit. And America's National Reconnaissance Office has sent its latest spy satellite into orbit, a highly classified mission, and they're giving nothing away. All that and more still to come on Space Time. This podcast brought to you by Ring. Save big right now on select Ring doorbells and cams and give the gifts that keep on giving. Find gifts that help handle all those deliveries. Hey, again? Uh, Leave it behind the chair with the others. And gifts that tell you when creatures are stirring. Biscuit, get away from the ornaments. Good girl. Shop the Black Friday sale and save up to 40% on select devices at ring.com. That's up to 40% off right now at ring.com. A new report claims a Chinese spacecraft has been observed grabbing hold of a satellite and moving it into a different orbit. The report was presented at a conference of the Centre for Strategic and International Studies and the Secure World Foundation. The manoeuvre involved China's Shijian 21 spacecraft, approaching and then grabbing the disused Bidao G2 navigation system satellite and moving it some 3,000 kilometres above the geostationary orbit it was previously in. The Shijian 21 then returned to its own near geostationary orbit. The entire manoeuvre was observed by telescopes belonging to the commercial space awareness firm Exoanalytic Solutions. And this isn't the first time the Shishan 21 has performed such a manoeuvre. As Spacetime reported last year, the same satellite was observed suddenly travelling with a companion spacecraft last November, just a month after its launch. Now at the time, the United States Space Force designated the unidentified companion object as a spent aperture kick motor. The problem is, the unidentified object remained in geostationary orbit next to the Shijian 21 instead of manoeuvring away in order to ensure it doesn't collide, as would be the usual protocol for a spent aperture kick motor. And that raised speculation, suggesting that this may have in fact been an experimental payload designed to test the Shijian 21's ability to perform rendezvous proximity operations and manipulate other satellites. China describes the Shijian 21 as a space debris mitigation satellite, a nice catch-all term, but it's refused to release any details about the spacecraft or its capabilities. However, about a month before the launch of the Shijian 21, Beijing did display a nondescript spacecraft described as an in-orbit tanker. That spacecraft was equipped with cameras and a set of robotic arms. Now, none of this is really all that new. There's a growing list of intelligence reports about both Russian and China testing new anti-satellite technologies. Last year, another Chinese satellite was tracked deliberately manoeuvring close to an American satellite, following it closely for some time and then manoeuvring away again. And in November 2019, a Russian Luchnovimp spacecraft moved to within 1.8 kilometres of the American Intelsat-36 telecommunications satellite, remaining there for some time before moving off again. Moscow have undertaken similar satellite operations on more than two dozen occasions, some going back as far as 2014 and 2015. So, it seems the battle for space is very much on. This is space time. Still to come, SpaceX launches a new classified spy satellite for the National Reconnaissance Office. And later in the science report, a new variant of the Omicron strain is now showing up globally. All that and more still to come on Space Time.
SpaceX has launched a highly classified spy satellite for America's National Reconnaissance Office. No details of the top-secret NRO-87 mission have been released. The flight aboard a Falcon 9 rocket flew from Space Launch Complex 4E at the Vandenberg Space Force Base in California, with a core stage returning to Vandenberg, touching down on landing zone 4. All systems continue to look good for an on-time liftoff. Falcon 9 is our two-stage rocket, standing at 230 feet, or about 70 meters tall, roughly the height of a 20-story building. When it's fully fueled, it'll hold just over a million pounds of propellant that the vehicle will burn through in less than three minutes after liftoff. We began loading those propellants on both stages of the vehicle back at T minus 35 minutes. The bottom two thirds of the vehicle is the first stage. While it's designed to be reflown 10 or more times with minimal refurbishment between flights, today will be the first flight for this particular booster. Uh, at the bottom of the first stage, there are nine Merlin engines that will get Falcon 9 off the ground and up to the thinner parts of the Earth's atmosphere. The two stages will separate from one another. The second stage continues to orbit, while the first stage makes its way back down to Earth for its landing attempt at landing zone four, which is not too far from where it will lift off. If successful, this will be the first landing for this booster. It will also mark the 105th successful recovery of an orbital class rocket. Now, as for the second stage, uh, that will ignite its single Merlin vacuum engine, or MVAC, uh, about two and a half minutes into flight. It's this engine that will take the NROL-87 spacecraft to its intended orbit. At the moment, our payload today is safely enclosed inside the 17-foot diameter payload fairing. This protects the satellite from aerodynamic heating, loads, and contamination during ascent. Once we reach the vacuum of space... Stage one, fuel load is complete. All right, good news there. Uh, stage one fuel load has completed. Um, now, once we reach the vacuum of space, we'll jettison those fairing halves uh, while the second stage continues on to orbit. Just like our Falcon 9 booster uh, today, these fairing halves are also brand new, and we will be attempting to retrieve them from the water once they make their way back to Earth. This mission is for the National Reconnaissance Office, or NRO. The NRO is responsible for developing, acquiring, launching, and operating America's reconnaissance satellites, as well as operating associated data processing facilities in support of national security. Security. These sophisticated systems are used to develop military targeting data, uh, support international humanitarian relief operations, and assess the impact of natural disasters. As a reminder, per the NRO's request, we will not be showing any views from our second stage today, and we will be ending our webcast around the T plus eight minute mark, uh, just shortly after Falcon 9 touches back down at landing zone four. So far, we are at T minus five minutes and uh, six seconds and all systems remain go for an on-time liftoff. The range remains green and ready to support. As for the weather, it's a gorgeous day for launch. We have basically 0% probability of violation with respect to weather rules for today. The vehicle and payload continue to be healthy. In fact, the payload is now on internal power. And if for some reason today that we are unable to launch, we do have a backup window tomorrow at the same time. And MD, CLD on countdown one. GMD, it's a MD. It's Coming through the final status check, you and your team are go for launch and landing. MD and team are go for launch and landing. Copy. The clamp arms on the transporter erector, or TE, have now begun to open in preparation for retraction of the TE. This is one of the last major visual milestones that we have prior to launch. At this point in time, both the first stage and second stage um, are nearly fully loaded with one million pounds of kerosene fuel and liquid oxygen, or LOX, as you often hear us call it. The fuel is completely loaded on both first and second stage, and we're expecting uh, the first stage to wrap up its um, LOX loading in about 15 seconds at T minus three minutes, and second stage will complete its LOX loading at T minus two minutes. At T minus 60 seconds, we'll hear a call out that Falcon 9 is in startup. Stage one, lock load complete. All right, so stage one is now fully loaded with both all of its fuel and liquid oxygen. And uh, we're waiting for a second stage to wrap up that lock load. When we hear the call out that Falcon 9 is in startup, that means that the rocket's autonomous internal flight computers have taken over the launch countdown. And then just inside of T minus two seconds, we will light the Merlin M1D engines and set for liftoff. Right now, the NROL-87 payload continues to be healthy on internal power, and the Falcon 9 team is tracking no issues on the rocket. Stage two, lock load complete. All right, there we heard the call out. Stage two, lock load is complete. At this point in time, the vehicle will start venting the liquid oxygen, the leftover liquid oxygen uh, basically left in the load lines. 
MD is go for launch. Falcon is in startup. There we just heard mission director is go for launch and that the vehicle is in startup. The autonomous, excuse me, the onboard flight computers have taken over the launch countdown. T minus 15, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. Liftoff of L87. Go Falcon, go, go. Vehicle pitching down range. Nominal first stage chamber pressures. We're now T plus 40 seconds into the NROL 87 mission. Falcon 9 is throttling down in preparation. Double power telemetry. In preparation for max Q, which will take place at T plus 1 minute and 12 seconds. Max Q, of, of course, being the moment in which the vehicle experiences the highest amount of aerodynamic pressure. Max Q. All right, there we heard the call out for Max Q. Everything looking good with stage one trajectory. Now in the next couple minutes, we have five events coming up in quick succession, starting with main engine cutoff, stage separation, stage one flip, second engine start one, and then the boost back burn. Main engine cutoff, as the start name suggests, we will throttle, or excuse me, we will shut down uh, all nine Merlin engines. The stages will separate. The first stage will actually flip over and conduct a boost back burn. Um, and that's what we have to do in order to fly the booster back towards land. And of course, during that time as well, we'll have second engine start one, where we will ignite the Merlin vacuum engine. Again, not a cloud in the sky, gorgeous liftoff from Vandenberg Space Force Base, Space Launch Complex 4 East. First stage engine cutoff. Stage separation confirmed. Stage one boost back startup. That first stage now is performing the boost back burn and, back pull, and there we heard the call burn. out that fairing separation has been confirmed unfortunately we're unable to broadcast that at the request of our customer but we were able to confirm the deployment of that we're now three minutes into launch and the next milestones coming up include the conclusion of the boost back burn and that will finish at t plus three minutes and 15 seconds stage one boost back shut down all right there we heard call out that the boost back burn has completed. Our first stage will be attempting a land landing in just a few moments. One of the nice things about land landings is that we're not subject to ocean weather, and it's pretty convenient to land the first stage basically right next to where it lifted off from. However, our ability to exit execute a land landing uh, really is dependent upon the customer's needs. Their mission trajectory and performance needed by the satellite is what determines if we can return to land. Most of the time, their requirements don't allow for a return to launch site, which is what we're performing today, which is why we also developed the capability to land our first stages on nominal trajectory. Good news there, both first and second stage um, reporting to have nominal trajectory. So that's why we developed our ability to land our first stages out in the ocean with our drone ships. Now, in order to complete today's land landing, the first stage has two more burns left. Next up is the entry burn, and that's where we will reignite three of the Merlin engines on the first stage. That will help to slow the booster down as it re-enters the upper part of the Earth's atmosphere. Four hypersonic grid fins, we deploy those shortly after the stages separate, and those grid fins help steer the vehicle during descent. You will also see a puff of white gas. Uh, that is nitrogen gas from attitude control systems that help control the vehicle's orientation. The booster is steering itself back to Vandenberg Space Force Base. Both vehicles are on a nominal trajectory. So the booster is now basically coming through the thicker part of the Earth's atmosphere. So we're going to slow its velocity down with this entry burn. Stage one, entry burn, startup. That entry burn has begun and this will last for another few seconds. Stage one, entry burn, shut down. The vehicle continues to steer itself for a precise landing back at landing zone four at Vandenberg Space Force Base. The next burn we have is the landing burn. During the first stage landing burn, a single Merlin engine, the center engine, will relight and slow the vehicle stage one, down. Stage FTS is safe. Stage Again, two FTS is safe. The landing zone is pretty close to our, our launch pad. Shortly before the vehicle touches down. Stage one landing burn startup. Landing zone coming into view for the first stage. Again, this is the first flight for this booster and first landing attempt. Stage one landing leg deploy. A picture perfect stage landing. One, landing of this first stage booster, its first flight and first landing. This booster will be prepared for reflight on another NRO mission later this year. This also marks our 105th overall successful recovery of an orbital class rocket, including both Falcon 9 and heavy first stage landings. The mission was flown into a 512.7 kilometer high sun-synchronous polar orbit. 
and that suggests the payload may be a next-generation electro-optical reconnaissance satellite. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Scientists around the world are keeping their eyes on a new descendant of the Omicron variant, which has already been found in at least 40 countries, including Australia. The new version of the coronavirus, which scientists have catalogued as B1.1529.2, or BA2 for short, shares 32 mutations with the original Omicron lineage BA1 variant. However, there are also 28 mutations which are quite different. Like other variants, BA2 represents a subclade that is just a little bit different from the current more abundant Omicron BA1 type, with unique deletions in the end terminus of the spike and also key changes in the receptor binding domain compared to BA1. And these changes could influence antibody binding. Still, the new changes in the receptor binding domain could increase transmissibility. And these properties could also make BA2 stealthier than the original version because some of the genetic traits appear to be harder to detect. So far, the BA2 variant represents only 0.3% of cases in Australia, 2.8% of Omicron sequences globally, but it does appear to already be outcompeting the original Omicron variant, especially in Denmark, where it's already thought to be responsible for 50% of all new infections. Over 5.7 million people have now been killed by the COVID-19 coronavirus since it first spread out of Wuhan, China. The World Health Organization warns that the true death toll could be double that amount, with more than 380 million confirmed cases globally. A new study warns that young sexual minority males and transgender women are at higher risk of transactional sex. The findings reported in the Journal of Adolescent Health suggest that some 20% of the group are especially vulnerable to exchanging sex for money, housing, goods and services. Scientists surveyed some 454 black and Latino teenagers and young adults aged between 15 and 24 in the Baltimore, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. and St. Petersburg, Tampa areas, 15% of whom were transgender. Now, these are East Coast urban areas that all have high rates of HIV and unstable housing among youth. Some 22% of recipients reported engaging in transactional sex, and 32% of those with HIV also reported doing so. More than 25% of participants who reported using drugs also engaged in transactional sex. A new study estimates there are now more than 73,000 known tree species on Earth, including some around 9,200 species yet to be discovered. The findings, reported in the Journal of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, is about 14% higher than the current number of known tree species. Most of the undiscovered species are likely to be rare, with very low population levels and limited spatial distribution and that makes them especially vulnerable to human-caused disruptions as effects like deforestation and climate change spread. To reach their conclusions, scientists combined tree abundance and occurrence data from two global data sets, one from the Global Forest Biodiversity Initiative and the other from Tree Change, which uses ground-sourced forest plot data. The combined databases yielded a total of 64,100 documented tree species. That's a total similar to previous studies which found around about 60,000 tree species on the planet. After combining the data sets, researchers used computer modelling to estimate the total number of unique tree species at biome, continental and global scales. Their conservative estimate is that the total number of tree species on Earth is now 73,274, which means there are likely to be about 9,200 tree species yet to be discovered. Australian Olympic officials have joined the FBI in warning all Olympic athletes and officials to leave their personal cell phone, tablets and laptops at home and only take burner devices with them to Beijing. Security agencies are warning that China is infecting visitors' phones, tablets and laptops with malicious surveillance codes that are now so sophisticated it secretly downloads automatically onto your phone, tablet or laptop without telling you or needing any permissions. 
The program activates as soon as you turn on the device, copying all existing files and software, and then monitoring all conversations within the phone's vicinity, even when the phone's switched off. The surveillance code can also automatically download itself onto the devices of anyone you call or send data to. Because of the threat, Australians at the Olympics have been warned to set up new separate browser and email accounts unlinked to any of their real accounts so as to avoid having their data stolen or contaminated by the Chinese government. But not all the cyber threats are so surreptitious. All Olympic athletes and officials have also been required to use the official Olympics app, My2022, in order to monitor their travel data and health information, including daily COVID-19 test results and vaccination status. All visitors to the Games were required to download the app 14 days prior to their departure from China and to use it as a daily record of their COVID status. Conveniently, the app also offers voice chats and file transfers. The problem is the so-called encryption it offers won't stop Chinese officials from accessing and studying all that data. And scientists from the University of Toronto Citizens Lab say the app doesn't specify where your personal data is sent or, for that matter, who has access to it. And if you study the app carefully, you'll find there's a sensitive keyword list designed to notify the Chinese state security surveillance apparatus if certain topics come up. Now, these topics include anything to do with the genocide of the Muslim Uyghur population, the summary arrest of Falun Gong members for use in forced human organ donation programs, the treatment of journalists and freedom campaigners in Hong Kong and Tibet, the names of Chinese leaders and government agencies, any reference to the 1989 killing of pro-democracy students in Tiananmen Square, or any reference to the disappearance of Feng Shui. The censorship list is bundled in the file illegalwords.txt. So, welcome to the Burner Olympics. Well, it seems the old spoon bender Yuri Geller's back. This time he's claiming to be on the hunt to find the sacred Ark of the Covenant. He also claims aliens are about to make contact with the people of Earth, so stand by for that. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says Yuri's latest prognostications just happen to coincide with him flogging his new book. Yuri Geller is probably one of the most interesting self-promoters around. Ever since he was doing his tricks with spoon bending and starting watches and all sorts of stuff back in the early 70s, he has been non-stop. And despite all proof and evidence to the contrary that he can't do what he says he can do, he is just running on his reputation as, as his, uh, his claim has been proved by the CIA, etc which is not correct. And for, for the last 50 years, he's been just making all these claims and putting himself in the front line. It gets him quoted in the paper, it gets him on TV, he probably gets a bit of money out of it by appearance fees and that sort of stuff. But he has to think of a new thing every time. He's re- recently got a new book out, which therefore looks at, uh, at UFOs and ancient astronauts and crash flying saucers and psychic warfare and Pentagon secrets and spy missions that he's been involved with, etc. all that, sorts man, of things. Just that, Isn't this Eric Von Danik? Yes, it is. It's, it's, uh, uh, Yuri Geller is nothing if not eclectic, and he likes to pick up all his claims from all over the place. But the most recent one is, is that he's he's setting out to find the Ark of the Covenant, which is the biblical Old Testament Ark that it's the, in the, the Area Fifty One. Well, I, I know we know that <laughs> it's put alongside with Rosebud, the sled used in uh, Citizen Kane. He reckons that when he finds it, it's going to cause an historical earthquake never before seen in history, meaning a sort of an academic earthquake. Not an actual worth going. And it is a very, very strange story that he keeps putting out these little publicity things. I mean, he claims to have helped Theresa May become Prime Minister of the UK, which he might have regretted. He made, he was going to ensure that Brexit failed which is obviously a failure on his part because Brexit went ahead. He claimed to have moved the earth or the land when um, some football team was going for a penalty goal. He made the sort of make sure the ball went off and didn't go in the goal. It, it's, it's all sort of um, just one thing after another after another, and he throws these things out. The Ark of the Covenant, it was last talked about in the Bible uh, before the sacking of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, which is, what, 500 years before Christ? So there or thereabouts, and after that, it simply disappeared. We we know nothing more about it. it wasn't mentioned anymore in the Bible. Yeah. The accepted theory is that the rabbis hid it through some secret passages, and then they died off. And those secret passages containing the Ark of the Covenant are still hidden somewhere under Jerusalem, 
the other yeah. the other theory is that the Babylonians got it. They have no idea what it was, and they melted it down and and used its gold to make jewellery. So yeah. Take, take, yeah. take your pick. That is the most likely explanation. It's an Indiana Jones type story at the moment. So um, and yeah, you, the story will disappear after a year. It's sort of like politicians' promises, you know. Who follows up uh, a year later? Apart from sceptics, of course, who do it all the time. Big spoil sports as we are. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 